Dear learners, greetings from IIT Guwahati. We are in the MOOCs course, Advanced Thermodynamics and Combustions, Module 8, Combustion and Flames. Till this point of time, we covered four lectures on laminar premixed flame, laminar diffusion flame, droplet evaporation and droplet burning. Today, we are going to focus on the last lecture of this module that is engine combustion and pollution. Till this point of time, we have covered all the basic aspects of theoretical backgrounds and mathematical modeling of combustions and in this lecture, we will try to focus on application part. Number one, number two, also we will look into the pollution levels or pollutions that comes out after the engine combustions. And if pollution has come out, then what is the criteria of uh, its quantifications? So, these things will be the focal point of our discussion today. So, on this lecture number 32, that is engine combustion and pollutions, we will discuss about the combustion phenomena in petrol engines, diesel engines, gas turbine engines and rocket engines. And all, uh, all these things will be just a preliminary conceptual um, thoughts, how this combustion phenomena happens. Subsequently, till this point of time, whatever methodology or mode of combustion we have uh, looked into, we will try to put a uh, glimpse that how those things, those concepts can be utilized in these engine combustions. And towards the last part of our discussions, we will uh, discuss about uh, pollutant emissions and how to quantify these emissions. And one of the important aspects which was supposed to be in this combustion course that was turbulent flames, but due to lack of time, we will not be able to cover this, but rather I will just put an introductory remarks uh, on this turbulent combustion flames, uh, turbulent flames towards the end of this lecture. Uh, so, let us start the first thing, uh, the combustion in petrol engines. We all know that uh, we all know about uh, the basic UG course uh, which is combustion in um, SI engines, spark ignition engines, where the combustion phenomena is mostly viewed that fuel and air mixtures enters into the engine combustion engine cylinders and towards the end of the compression stroke, the spark plug uh, ignites the charge and as a result uh, the combustion happens. This was the thought we put when you discuss in the um, ICE engine course. Now, uh, I will just add or uh, something further that uh, and to whatever discussions we have made so far, this particular uh, nature of combustions falls as the pre-mixed combustions where the pre-mixed air and fuel combustions uh, happens, uh, I mean uh, is prepared uh, locally and they, it is a homogeneous mixture and when it enters spark is spark uh, gets generated or we ignite the fuel through a spark and through this we generate a flame front and this flame front propagates into com in the combustion space. What we can see is that if you can just typically view this is the combustion zone, we can have we can think about many number of layers 1, 2, 3, 4 like these zones. Now, when the uh, at the beginning of uh, mm, and in, in this entire zone, we have this homogeneous fuel and air mixture. Now, when the spark is ignited, the zone 1 gets affected. So, the a flame front is initiated and slowly this flame front moves to the zone 2, zone 3, zone 4 and as and when it propagates into the um, different zone, we can see that zone 1 would be once it completes the zone 1, zone 1 will be full of combustion products whereas, zone 2, 3, 4 and they are not combustion has not been attempted or has not started. And subsequently, when the flame, flame, flame front moves through these zones, it keeps on igniting the subsequent fuels. As a result, entire cylinder space will is covered with the complete combustion products. 
and this uh, uh, combustion process can be thought of three major uh, regions one is ignition and flame developments and here uh, this ignition happens with an through a spark plug because it creates an electric discharge then uh, during the flame propagation uh, phase uh, almost 80 to 90 percent of the charge is burnt and because of this we we, we find a sudden rise in the pressure and towards the flame termination that means when the combustion uh, the flame plant reaches to the last zone only 5 percent of charge is burnt and that is viewed as the drop in pressures. Now, if you look at the pressure and crank angle diagrams or the subsequently pressure time diagram, we can see that at one particular location of the crank angle ignition happens and it is it starts with a slow rise in the pressures and followed by a sudden rise in pressures and when the flame front is in the termination mode, the, the pressure peak drops down and as uh, and uh, we will we'll see that uh, towards the expansion stroke the pressure drops. Another important phenomena in the spark ignition engine is the knocking. So, what could have happened is that in during a normal combustion process if the it happens uh, if all the if, if the flame plant which is initiated uh, through this um, in the zone 1 subsequently burns the subsequent the charge in the different zones then we will have a normal combustion and due to variety of regions if there is some rise in the uh, pressures uh, or rise in the temperature some due to some regions in the zone uh, 3 or 4 not due to flame plant rather due to self ignition then we can think about uh, uh, some kind of disturbances in the pressure pulse and those disturbances are typically uh, called as knock. So, uh, in a normal combustion uh, phenomena the, uh, the trace of the pressure time diagram is a smooth and whereas, with a knocking situations we will find towards the expansion stroke there is uh, a kind of uh, oscillations that drops in. Uh, towards the end phase of the combustion. So, what we can say is that knocking if at all has to happen, it is a it is very likely that zone 4 is the most affected zone uh, or uh, we can say zone 4 is the uh, uh, locations at which uh, we can expect a self ignition due to knocking and as a result of knocking. Then we will move to combustion in the diesel engines. Uh, we all know that uh, when uh, diesel engines are governed with auto cycles and it is a constant pressure based combustion. And here uh, instead of uh, the pre mixed air fuel mixture, we normally do uh, that air is compressed with within the engine cylinders and fuel injectors, uh, fuel is injected into this chamber through uh, an injection process. And we all know uh, in our earlier discussions that we have seen two important concepts one is diffusion flame, other is droplet combustion. First thing is that when uh, the when a, a fuel jet comes from through the injectors, it forms a, a flame jet, as you can see here, it is a diffusion flame jet. And, uh, uh, when we have a constant density mode, we have analyzed one thing that fuel jet injected into a question to air. Uh, same thing we can view here that when the it is injected it is in the liquid form and when it forms it sees a medium where it is a already peak um, it sees a medium with heated air. So, this uh, fuel liquid droplets uh, gets vaporized by seeing this environments. So, in this case what happens the fuel gets injected from an injector and it uh, when it comes out from the injector it sees an ambience which is an elevate which is a, a compressed air at elevated pressure and temperatures. So, as a result the self ignition will occur. Now, uh, such self ignition process is modeled through a layer of diffusion sheets. So, here you can say that there are different zone A, B, C, D, E. So, A can be considered as a too rich to burn 
B can be considered a rich but combustible. C can be considered as a stoichiometric that means a fuel and air has uh, on this flame sheet it is stoichiometric combustion happens. D uh, is lean but combustible and E is too lean to burn. So, all these things uh, we can the different zone happens here. Now, such a thing if has to be modeled through a diffusion sheet model then we can say on this particular flame sheet one situation could be the fuel air is in the stoichiometric proportions and within this flame sheet the we may have combination of uh, fuel as well as products and uh, outside these things we may have combination of oxidizer and products because it is a lean mixture. So, I just try to correlate this fact that uh, same thing happens that is two important phenomena one is through flame sheet other is that droplet combustion that means liquid droplets that comes through the injector it gets vaporized. So, and uh, we can uh, that uh, and in fact there are uh, the droplets have certain lifetimes and this subsequent droplets gets created and they um, also after that uh, they also dies down after the lifetime is over. And entire phenomena that happens uh, uh, only in a few millisecond durations. And of course, when you look at specifically in the diesel engines, there are different ways that uh, fuel injection can take place. One is indirect injection, other is direct injections. So, in the indirect injection what happens? The fuel is injected under high pressure into the pre-combustion chamber. The fuel droplets begin to evaporate and fuel vapor mixes with air in the chamber. And some portion of the fuel and air mixture auto ignite and this initiate a non premixed combustion. And because of this heat release pressure rises in the pre combustion chamber. And subsequently the partially reacted fuel air mixture and the remaining fuel droplets mix with additional air in the main chamber to complete the uh, burning process. The other category of uh, the injection systems is the direct injection systems. So, recent uh, advantage is that uh, instead of um, uh, looking for this earlier version uh, pre-combustion chamber, we can think of the injecting the fuel through a multi-hole fuel injector systems because it is a, uh, it's a quite uh, efficient process in the burning of the fuel. Uh, and in this process what happens the fuel air mixture is governed by the process injection process uh, as well as the air motion within the combustion space. So, here the combustion phenomena is viewed as pre-mixed as well as the diffusion control mode. And uh, we all know that diesel fuels are less volatile than, than the SI engine fuels because they readily auto ignite. So, the rate at which the fuel vaporizes and mixes with air at par uh, with the rate of reaction leading to the auto ignition. Then uh, uh, other important aspect is that the fuel uh, the when the first fuel is injected into the chamber, um, then uh, uh, before it is subjected to an ignition source. So, when you talk about the ignition source, it means that at, so in the entire combustion sp space, there are some pockets or, or zones where the it is expected that fuel can be auto ignited. And slowly once that auto ignition takes place the, the flame front generated at that point. Uh, and subsequently th with that zone it uh, the information is transferred to the other uh, zones or the flame uh, propagates to the other zones and uh, side by side there are also parallel fuels that is subsequently injected. So, the entire process is uh, governed through a diffusion mode since the ignition source which is a pre existing flame is present uh, when the fuel is injected. The droplet evaporation and burning are also important for direct and indirect engines. So, here uh, we when you think about the mode of combustion we can uh, bring the concept of droplet evaporation and burning. The uh, moving to next uh, uh, type of combustion that we normally do in gas turbine engines. These gas turbine engines are normal uh, are usually employed in the aircrafts 
so here also it is similar concept as that of diesel engines, uh, but uh, with a different philosophy or different technology. So, uh, if you look at the particular figure um, that uh, talks about the schematic of annular turbine which uh, consists of um, a diffuser as well as um, nozzles uh, or the it is basically an annular um, section and in this annular section entire combustion process is a each model. So, if you look at this uh, combustor it has three different zones one is primary zone, secondary zone and dilution zone. So, air that comes into the system uh, that means compressed air from the compressor unit comes into the combustor and in this combustion we have fuel nozzles and typically they are incorporated in the primary zones. Uh, so, the fuel is injected to uh, this uh, into the air and at side by side uh, the air motion that means speed of the air is also very high side by side uh, the mixing takes place. So, uh, and, and, and in fact this is one such nozzle there are multiple nozzles that means uh, the, uh, the fuel is injected into air at multiple locations of this annular space. So, as a result this mixing takes place and during this process already it is a heated temperatures. So, we can say that they are atomized within the annular section of the combustor. Of course, uh, to have the sustained combustions we can do a swirling actions or uh, recirculation zones which is created within this uh, uh, annular portions to have a stabilized flame. And the pre-mixed combustion uh, is generally achieved by vaporizing the fuel and mixing with air before the mixer enters to the, into the hot combustion zone where it ignites and burns. Now, this is what happens in the primary zone and subsequently when air when it comes to the secondary zones uh, uh, that means, uh, in, in the entire combustor in the entire combustor there are different zones and these different zones have different purposes because when the sustained flame gets initiated in the primary zone and it moves to this through this annular sections then we expect that uh, a regulated uh, tailored flame has to be generated when it enters into the um, uh, turbines because at that point the, the entire combustion products has to happen. Now, to have those those things the secondary zone or dilution zones have, have, have a prime uh, important role. So, what does they do is that um, uh, side by side uh, we in the secondary zones uh, we also supply fuel and also the uh, mixing or swirling actions such that when it enters we get a stabilized combustion or the flame gets stabilized. There is a concept called uh, liner cooling flow. So, what does this mean is that if you look at the another view of the sections. So, this one particular section. So, if you can see this arrow lines these are nothing but airs and this uh, this is the air flow arrow lines refers to the air flow and these are the holes which are uh, kept in the, as in the primary zone secondary zone and uh, maybe uh, the uh, dilution zone and uh, what we have is that uh, in addition to this primary air we also have a secondary air that comes from this compressors and they call this as a liner cooling now this liner cooling is required because what happens is that we expect a particular temperature distributions towards the at the end of the combustor that means when the flame um, is about to enter into the turbines we expect the flame temperature distributions along the radial direction in such a way that the turbine gets the minimal thermal stress. So, to have this we require this liner coolings. So, what do we mean by this minimal stress means that that is where the uh, role of dilution zone comes into pictures. 
what we expect is that uh, if you look at turbine viewpoint, turbine normally faces the highest temperature in a gas turbine engines and because of these uh, high temperatures or um, hot spot gases, uh, they can damage the turbine blades. So, in order to reduce this thermal endurance, we expect that there has to be a, a particular temperature distributions across the turbine blades. And what uh, uh, we expect is that the gas turbine temperature has to be tailored to increase uh, it from blade root through a maximum then decrease at the tape. So, the temperature profile has to be tailored in such a way that it should increase first again then while it reaches to the blade tip the temperature should fall down. So, there the role of dilution zone comes into pictures and the through this dilution zone we tailor the frame or give a particular temperature distribution pattern to the flame uh, such that the thermal endurance at the turbine blades gets minimized. And such a temperature distribution pattern for the gas turbine combustor outlet is known as uh, pattern factor. Normally, what type of uh, temperature distribution we require at the end of the combustor is nothing but your pattern factor that has to be taken into account while doing this. And for this, the dilution zones normally it is a kind of a cooling effect that is produced for the flame to quench and subsequently entire combustion products has to expand. So, this is a different part of uh, discussions. So, this particular concept talks about the gas turbine combustor. The next part or when you travel faster the gas combustion will not happen we require some kind of uh, other technology uh, where we should avoid the use of mechanical devices. Rather we expect uh, that some uh, the phenomena through shock waves or shock assisted combustion comes into pictures. Uh, so, what happens is that uh, is that when you uh, travel faster uh, it is uh, uh, faster number one and when you going to very high altitudes that is a lack of uh, uh, oxygen or oxidizers. So, the uh, rocket engines normally carry fuel and oxidizers in separate tanks and these fuel and oxidizers are normally the liquid uh, typically liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. And the concentration in liquid is done because they have large energy density as compared to the gas phase uh, mode. And there are two types of uh, combustor, one is uh, pressure fed type, other is pump fed type. What happens if you look at this particular figure, the we have a high pressure gas and this high pressure gas pressurizes the fuel and oxidizer tank through this propellant valve. As a result, uh, um, the fuel is injected into the thrust chamber. Uh, whereas, uh, in a pump fit type, uh, the we do not have this high pressure gas medium, rather we have two different pumps that um, takes the that gives necessary pressures uh, for this propellant valve to get uh, to inject the fuel into the combustion zone. The thrust of the engine is produced by creating hot high pressure gas from the combustion of fuel and oxidizer in the combustion chamber. The flow is subsequently accelerated through the supersonic diverging nozzles. In fact, uh, the type of uh, combustion that is going to happen is one is droplet because uh, that uh, it is a droplet kind of combustion. And here also we can think uh, premix and diffusion burning which is likely to happen in a rocket combustion mode. Uh, another important aspect is that when you think about uh, rocket combustions, the subsonic combustion is normally referred as ramjet combustions and supersonic combustions are referred as ramjet combustions. So, these are different terminology that are used in the rocket engines. The next uh, 
uh, important um, aspect that we are going to discuss is the pollutant emissions. In fact, the control of pollutant emissions is a major factor in the design of modern combustion systems because uh, the primary air L, uh, that are emitted directly from the source via chem many chemical reactions affect the uh, atmospheres. So, when such reaction takes place, they affect environment as well as the human health in many ways. First is altered properties of the atmosphere because this combustion phenomena changes the atmosphere very air work quality. They are harmful for vegetations, they also damage uh, soils and of course, deteriorate the materials and there is a potential increase in the sickness and moral mortality of the human beings. So, these are the kind of uh, societal uh, loss due to the pollutions. Now, typically in the engine combustions, the type of pollutants are first thing is particulate matter. So, particulate matters comes as a soot particles, fly ash, metal fumes, aerosols that we can see in the uh, atmosphere. Then we have sulfur dioxide either in the form of SO2 and SO3. Then we may have unburnt or partially burnt hydrocarbons. Then we can have oxides of nitrogen NOx typically NO2 or NO. We may have carbon monoxides then greenhouse gases they are, they are N2O and CO2. So, all these things are the culprits for the human civilization. So, the origins of all these things are nothing but the premixed combustion and non premixed combustions. Other possibilities could be they um, we do not operate the combustion through uh, through a non stoichiometric mode or um, normally the combustion processes are um, occur uh, due to uh, through non stoichiometric mode or dissociation of nitrogen and impurities in the fuel and air. Now, let us see the how those pollutant emissions are affecting the uh, human life and the atmosphere. Uh, the undesirable emissions generated during a combustion process of automobiles and ice engines pollute the environment and they contribute to global warming, acid rain, smog, odor, respiratory and uh, health issues. Now, one of the major concern of the uh, pollutants is in the tro troposphere and this troposphere is nothing but the lowest layer of the atmosphere and what happens there? the uh, emission of NOx and uh, when you talk about the civil transport aircrafts. So, when they at lower altitudes normally they travel at 30,000 feet altitude. So, at that locations the question of emission of NOx becomes a vital factor. What happens there uh, is that uh, if you look at atmosphere, we have it is covered with ozone layer and these ozone layers protect the sunlights. So, uh, various wavelengths forms of the sunlight gets protected through the ozone layer and they do not come back to the earth surface. And But what this pollution does is that uh, the uh, these pollutions creates uh, or, or breaks that ozone layer. How? That is uh, uh, known as catalytic destructions. The catalytic destruction of stratospheric air ozone is through the formation of NO in the reaction mechanism has a deadly consequences. The removal of ozone from the at stratosphere allows harmful ultraviolet solar radiations to penetrate into earth atmosphere. How? First thing is that when you have this NO formations when it reacts with O3, it gives it gives NO2 and O2. And this NO2 again plus mix with O, it gives NO plus O2. Now, again this NO2 when it gets energy from the sunlight, it forms NO plus O. So, in our words means NO and O, they act as a catalyst. 
every time those things are there it keeps on forming NO and because of this NO O, O3 I mean it breaks the ozone layer O3 because NO only reacts with an O3 to um, form O2. So, because of this reason uh, we can say the ozone is destroyed first by uh, reaction NO while NO is again regenerated in the second reactions. And another important aspect is that monoatomic oxygen is highly reactive. So, it initiates many reactions one of them is the ozone formation at the ground level as well and which is harmful for lungs and uh, biological tissues. Ozone although it protects the sunlight, but at the ground level the ozone, ozone has a harmful effect for the human bodies. So, these are the side effects of the pollutants and let us see the how, how you can quantify the um, emissions. So, one way to look at the emissions is uh, representing uh, as a emission index. The emission index for any species which is formed due to combustion if you denote that I is the ratio of mass of the species to the mass of the fuel burnt by the combustion process. Uh, in particular this emis uh, emission index E i is a dimensionless quantity, but we typically represent uh, like grams per kg of fuels uh, so that we can quantify in a proper manner. This E i expresses the amount of pollutant that is formed per unit mass of the fuel and independent of any dilution of the product streams or efficiency of the combustion process. And this E i can be treated as the measure of efficiency of a particular combustion process in producing a, uh, a particular pollutants. The combustion hydrocarbons of fuels in air is uh, determined through the concentration uh, or mole fraction measurements assuming the fuel uh, carbon appears as a CO2 or CO. Uh, so, what you one way to look at is define the term emission index E i for uh, the uh, species i mass of the species i which is emitted to the kg of the fuel burnt. Now, such uh, things if you want to express in the uh, molar form, uh, we can say that particular the parameter of interest is either CO2 or CO and, uh, and we have to normalize the species I with respect to CO and CO2 and, uh, and if each of them uh, we can find out through this chemical reactions and here X is the a uh, mole fraction of uh, mole fraction m w stands for the molecular weight. So, these are the by definitions other way of to quantify this emissions normally the emission analysis is done through a gas analyzer we take, take a strip of gas or certain quantity of the gas at the end of uh, the uh, uh, combustion pipe. Uh, so, taking that sample we try to measure. Now, if you look at uh, a particular combustion equations for a hydrocarbon fuel, if you say C x H y is a fuel and um, it mixes with air with a um, quantity of oxygen and 3.76 a quantity of nitrogen, then uh, it gives C O 2 ideally it should give C O 2 H 2 O 2 and 2 and there are some stress species. And these stress species could be formation of CO, NO um, depending on the nature of the mixture they can be like this. Now, here the uh, one important um, point is that whatever stress species that appears in these reactions that can be controlled through the quantity B means that can be linked or that can be correlated the equivalent quantity of oxygens through the parameter B. So, for that reasons we say that the uh, we, we define a parameter called as a concentration corrected to particular level of O2 in the product stream that is typically uh, referred in the literatures to uh, have uh, a kind of a proper comparisons. 
And these corrected concentrations is either represented as a wet basis or dry basis. Now, to represent dry basis, what you say that if you look at reactions, so if suppose if you want to calculate on dry basis, so concentration of Xi and dry will be Ni that is number of moles of species I divided by N mixture dry. Now, when the uh, total mixture uh, number of moles for the mixture needs to be calculated, then this H2O has to be ignored. Now, when you calculate with respect to weight, the H2O has to be included. That means, the coefficients of H2O that is Y by 2 has to be included in the total number of moles. Uh, I am not going into details. So, once you take the balancing, different formulations can be made like N mixer by N dry and N mixer weight by N by dry, we can frame the um, xi as a ratio of this dry to weight combinations. Another way of uh, looking at that, uh, let, uh, let us take that when we are talking measuring the emissions through gas analyzers, we are uh, measuring at certain level of uh, level 1. So, in the level 1, we are measuring some O2 and this, this uh, things has to be corrected to another level O2, which means that if I change the or if I control the combustion parameters, so that we can get another level O2, then what would be uh, the concentration of the species. So, basically distress species regulations can be controlled through with an appropriate measure uh, related to uh, uh, the oxygen concentrations. So, these things uh, a simple algebraic simple equations can be formed, formed for this for a particular trace species uh, I with respect to its concentration at level 2 and level 1 and they can be correlated with respect to mixtures with respect to mixtures of oxygen at level 1 and level 2. So, these things will uh, um, explain when you solve the problem, uh, solve a numerical problem towards the end of this class we will explain more details onto this. So, this is all about uh, the quantification of uh, emissions and there are some other methods which are typically called as mass specific emission MAC which is defined in terms of emission index and brake power. And also we have specific emissions defined in terms of uh, fuel uh, um, energy that is enthalpy of combustion and emission index. So, different uh, philosophies or different applications require the quantification of emissions in a um, different perspectives. This is all about uh, the content. Uh, now, uh, I am going to the last segment that is which was supposed to be the part of this course, but due to the lack of time and lack of the nature of the course, it is very difficult to um, follow this uh, turbulent flames, but rather I will just uh, end this combustion with an introduction to turbulence flames. So, in the uh, combustion mode we dis discussed premixed combustion, non premixed combustion, uh, laminar premixed flame, diffusion flame, flames, droplet combustion, droplet burning all these concept we have introduced. What we have not and also uh, uh, to some extent we try to see how they can be mathematically modeled. By looking at this equations, we can make a uh, judgment that uh, when we go, uh, when you bring more number of equations, the complicacy becomes um, tremendous, I means it is very significant com complication happens. This is exactly ha what happens in a uh, turbulent flow situations. Uh, typically same concept that is pre-mixed combustion and non-pre-mixed combustion can be equally applicable, but due to uh, um, the nature of equations, we will ha will land off having a complicated equations and those equations uh, uh, is almost difficult to solve. Uh, uh, to give my final notes on this turbulence combustions, I can say many applications require turbulent flames for self-sustained combustions. 
the turbulent combustions can have premixed flame as well as uh, non premixed flame the premixed flame is uh, combustion is modeled by three distinct zones one is laminar flame zone uh, flamelets eddies regime and distributed reaction zones whereas non premixed flames are normally modeled through the simple jet flames the flame stabilization of uh, premixed turbulent combustion is generally achieved by incorporating pores, blob bodies and area change processes. Uh, we can have swirling flames that are often introduced in the practical devices um, for non premixed turbulent combustion and in, it emphasizes recirculation zones for flame stabilization and shortening the flame length. The characteristics flame time, characteristics chemical times, fast chemistry are some of the important features for the turbulent com combustions and because of this region there is a tremendous complexity which is involved in mass, species and energy conversion conservation equations with fast chemical kinetics reaction mechanisms. So, this I leave it to the research space that uh, individuals can look into and of course, uh, the final note I can say of course, that there is not a definite solutions for a given applications and many a times the empirical correlations are relied upon for uh, realistic estimates. The last part I will try to solve a numerical problem which is based on uh, the uh, quantification of emissions. The problem statement says that in an engine test which uses iso octane fuel, we measure the exhaust products by volume uh, base by volume on dry basis and they are CO2, CO, O2, NO, C2, H4 equivalent. That means, these are the trace species which need to find out and they are nothing but the uh, C2, C6, H4, H14 equivalent and we need to uh, and see uh, we need to find out the uh, um, emission index of unburnt hydrocarbons. So, in, instead of unburnt hydrocarbons we have uh, introduced C 6 H 14 or hexane equivalent. So, to do this uh, uh, first thing that we have to recall that what is the definition of emission index. So, E i instead of i subscript i we are writing C 6 H 14 that is equ equivalent to by definition we write C 6 H 14 divided by concentration of C O plus concentration of C O 2 this is multiplied by x time molecular weight of uh, mm, species. So, C species is C 6 H 14 X n divided by molecular weight of fuel. So, fuel in our case is C 8 8 H 18. So, here we say fuel as iso octane and that is C 18 H 18 its molecular weight is 114 kg by kg mole and when you talk about hydrocarbon and this is hexane equivalent that is C 6 H 14 its molecular weight is uh, 86 kg per kg mole. Now, uh, what is x? x is uh, number of moles of carbon per mole of fuel. So, we have one mole of fuel will contain 
1 mole of fuel C18 has 18 contents, number of carbon as 8. So, we can say x is equal to 8. And what data has been given? Uh, the concentration of x, x, CO. x, CO is given as 0 0.1 percent, that is 0 0.001 x CO2 is given as 12.5 percent that is 0 0.125. So, we have all the values here. Now, inserting the value then we can estimate E i emission index with hexen equivalent C6 H14 as 0 0.0172 kg by kg of fuel and ideally we write it as 17 point gram per kg of fuel which means if you take 1 kg of iso octane that is C18 H18 it will give you 17.5 grams of unburnt hydrocarbons equivalent to hexane. So, this is what it means. Next thing for the same problem, we are going to find out NO concentration on weight basis. And for this problem, we have to recall the conversion of dry concentration to weight concentrations. So, the for that things we have to recall the expressions x n o o weight is nothing but x n o dry then n mixture dry divided by n mixture weight. So, we have fuel C8 H18, where we can say x is equal to 8, y is equal to 14. So, if you say Cx Hy, y will be 18. So, this is fuel, and, uh, and this uh, ratio N mixture weight divided by n mixture dry has this relation that is 1 plus y by 2 into 4.76 a minus y by 4. Now, in this case we need to find out what is a because we all know y. So, what is a? a is defined as x plus 1 minus j O2 dry because you are finding out dry first into y by 4 divided by 1 minus 4.76 j O2 dry because the data what gives is on dry basis. So, x O2 is given as 2 percent that is 0 0.02. So, accordingly we can find out A as 13.7. We know x, we know y, we know j, O2 dry. So, A is 13.7. Then this ratio can now be found out with knowledge of y a and a. This ratio is 1.148. Now, once you know this 1.148. So, x n o weight would be uh, x n o dry is x n o dry is 76 ppm divided by 1.148 because this is the other way. So, x n o weight can be calculated as 66.2 ppm. 
what we see is a no concentration in wet form is less than uh, the a no concentration in dry form. So, this is the problem demonstrate how you need to com uh, compare the wet concentration and dry concentrations. The last problem, last part of the problem where we are trying to correlate, a, correlate the two different streams of uh, exhaust streams with different concentration of O2. So, in the stream 1, uh, in the level 1, we have concentration of O2 as 2 percent, in the level 2, we need to have concentration of O2 as 5 percent. So, how these two concentration regulates the NO measurements? This is the uh, this is the uh, things that we need to address. Now, for this problem, uh, we almost have uh, this uh, data which are available with us. So, we have to use two expressions NOx mixture dry and mixture wet expressions and for this uh, um, we can say N mixture uh, xi O2 concentration that can be found out from this expressions. So, we have 4.76 x x in, in this case is x in the case is 8 because C8 H18 in plus 1 minus x O2 dry x O2 dry is 0 0.02 y is 18, x is 8. So, it is 18 by 4 divided by 1 minus 4.76 xi O2 is 0 0.02. So, this and minus 18 by 4. So, this x2 concentration at uh, level 1 we get 60.8. This is at 2 percent concentration. Now, similarly, we can find out N mixture uh, xi O2 at 5 percent O2 concentrations, where we need to uh, replace x xi O2 as 0.05. So, this will give you uh, the value as this will imply it will be uh, 4.76 into 8 plus 1 minus 0 0.05 instead of 0 02 we are writing 0 0.05. So, eight, 18 by 4 divided by 1 minus 4.76 into 0 0.05 and this minus 18 by 4 which will give you this number as 72.2. So, we have two numbers one is this number other is that number data that is given x i current at level 1 at level 1 is um, 76 and no concentration at level 1 is 76. So, we can say x and no at level 2 would be x n o at level 1 that is 76 ppm into at level 1 this value at n equivalent value of mixture at O2 at level 1 is 60.8 divided by 72.2. So, this number is 64 ppm. So, what it says is that by regulating the oxygen concentration to 5 percent, we can see that NO concentration drastically reduces. So, in other words, we can control our unburnt uh, mixture in such a way, so that we can regulate the oxygen concentration to 5 percent. So, if you in that means, you have 
in, in, in on dry basis when the oxygen concentration increases from 2 to 5 percent, you can see a no concentration reduces from 60, 76 ppm to 64 ppm. This is what the idea for reducing the pollutants from the during a combustion process by regulating the oxygen concentrations and that is where the importance of this expression is realized. So, with this I conclude this particular lecture, this particular module until date we have completed all the modules and thank you uh, for your attentions. I hope you have enjoyed all the modules and best wishes and best of luck for your future career. Thank you. Thank you.